Hey, welcome back to another session of Business Ethics. Uh, tonight we're going to be starting our kind of what is the, in my mind, the culminating unit to the whole quarter. Um, we got one more unit after this one, uh, a very short thing we're going to do um, during our finals period um, in finals week. But the three readings we have for this section, which I'm calling the social and economic justice section, is uh, a whole, uh, it's, it's kind of everything that you've been studying and doing all quarter is sort of like preparing you for this conversation. Um, I mentioned with the international business uh, unit that this was going to be kind of like a, a segue almost into the social and economic justice topic because uh, with the international business topic there's like this mesh point I talked about between the kind of context of most of, most of the ethics we've talked about up to this point like individual roles like employees, managers, certain particular people trying to figure out uh, that are like wearing a certain type of hat, like how are they supposed to serve in that role, what sort of choices should they make, how do they respons ethically responsibly manage their power or position um, in controlling the business. Um, that's kind of on this very grounded specific sort of context, but in international business, the like duties of managers and setting company policy is buttressed up against this like really big picture discussion of morality writ large. Um, and that's what we're going to be doing with social and economic justice too. We're not really going to be talking about particular people and their particular actions. Um, we're evaluating things on the scale of social institutions all the way up to the scale of how all of society is working. Um, so it's a little bit more abstract. Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder to have um, maybe some imagination to build uh, like a moral imagination that comes from like imagining yourself in a particular situation. What would I do if I was in this situation kind of thing? Um, I'm starting with Rawls because Rawls's way of approaching this topic about the really big picture stuff of justice in society does give you some like imaginative footholds in thinking about yourself as an individual. Um, so it'll be an easing into this a little bit, um, but it's still pretty abstract and uh, I, in my experience, the toughest material of the quarter uh, to follow. So don't be shy. Anyone who's in chat, do not be shy by asking questions. This is if the if there was ever a unit in which I strongly encourage it, it's it's this one um, because it is a little different change of pace. Um, but there, something that's going to help us is that a lot of the ideas that are uh, floating around in this conversation um, will look familiar, especially from um, our ethical theory stuff that we did, our crash course in ethical theory from the beginning of the quarter. Um, and anything that's been kind of in the more theoretical direction. Um, so you are prepared. Uh, it's it's a tough tough mountain to climb, I think. Um, if, if if any of you are finding like, oh, no problem, this made sense, very easy, cool. <laughs> but um, my experience is this is pretty tough. Um, so don't be shy about asking questions. And yeah, yeah, you struggle a little bit with the reading, Lauren. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Get ready for Cohen next week. Cohen's going to be a real... A real piece of work. Um, still, uh, very interesting stuff. I like these writers. I think they, uh, compared with other people who are talking about the same subject matter, these are some of the clearest. Um, they're also some of the most influential, too. Uh, the three philosophers we're looking at here, John Rawls, Robert Nozick, and then um, this guy named G.A. Cohen, they're all kind of big deals. Um, Rawls and Nozick, our late 20th century philosophers um, both had a huge impact and influence um, on contemporary discussions of social justice. Um, Nozick is, I've mentioned before, is kind of like the, the um, his book Anarchy, State, and Utopia, which we're going to have selections from when we do Nozick, um, is kind of like the libertarian Bible for libertarians today. Um, and uh, Rawls, when he published his book uh, justice as fairness, which is the material we're covering tonight, um, that just was like a huge stone in the pond too. Really uh, opened up a huge amount of discussion and debate. Um, and Cohen is probably the most, I would say, influential or preeminent Marxist, contemporary Marxist. 
Um, so all these guys are big deals. Um, so you'll, if you ever go on and want to study more of this stuff, you'll oftentimes find them referenced. Um, Brawls has been referenced a couple times actually by other readings that we've had this quarter. Um, I think Velasquez mentioned Rawls, and Hosnas is sort of in the Rawlsian territory here too. He's definitely, uh, even, I don't know if he mentions Rawls by name, but he definitely brings up some of Rawls's ideas. Um, so, uh, important stuff, um, and a very important topic. Uh, it kind of sets a context and a framing for a lot of other things. I've actually thought about starting it with this unit, um, but I've just felt like, Maybe it's, uh, in terms of subject matter, a little difficult. It's better to save it toward the end. Um, but this unit might be fun to kind of like go back and rethink some of the other conversations we've had this quarter in light of the conversations that are going to happen in this unit. Because um, they might shed new light or a different perspective on things. It's also fairly plausible that some of the stuff, that some of the ideas that come up here um, might be relevant for your paper projects too. Um, whenever you've got more generalized theories here, um, it's definitely um, easier to see how they could be relevant to almost any discussion that happens. And they might be able to, uh, like looking at things through their lens might get you to spot some stuff that maybe you wouldn't otherwise spot. Which is what I said uh, way back at the beginning of the quarter is like, that's the value of ethical theory. That it kind of gives you some new ways of looking at situations and spotting what could even potentially be a matter of moral concern or moral relevancy. So this is really cool stuff. I'm very excited to give these lectures. Um, they're really fun to do. A lot of interesting ideas. Um, but let's talk a little bit about just framing. I want to start with kind of framing up um, what the conversation's all about. And in framing up Rawls, I mean, this stuff's going to go for the whole shebang. For It'll go for Nozick. It'll go for Cohen. Um, this is this will be good setup for the whole unit. And the first thing I want to talk about is social justice itself. Um, and I want to first kind of discuss what makes social justice different from regular old vanilla justice. Um, and uh, in class this afternoon with my other section, I kind of did this little like, let's have a discussion. Like, what do you think social justice is? And the online format doesn't quite permit for that whole thing, so I won't be as cagey about it um, and just kind of tell you what I think is significant here in terms of framing. But um, social justice is different from regular old justice. But it's also, um, and, and really the right way to think about this is that uh, social justice is under the umbrella of capital J justice. Um, but uh, there's things that are a mat that are matters of justice that don't concern social justice. But to say that, to say that there's a kind of this is a more narrow scope conversation, uh, is not to say that social justice is something somehow avoidable, or optional, or something like that. And I never thought I would have to mention that sort of thing when I first started giving these lectures like six years ago. Uh, I didn't really build this next part of my lecture into the lecture. Uh, but um, maybe some of you uh, have heard the phrase social justice warriors, like used on the internet. Does that sound familiar to anyone in chat? Heard that phrase? Yep. Huh? Yeah. Um, People use it somewhat in different ways. Uh, my understanding is that social justice warriors, even if it didn't start this way, it's mostly used as a pejorative term for people who are uh, usually liberal, um, progressive types uh, that are really concerned about issues of social justice and talk about them and advocate for them publicly. And sort of labeling them as social justice warriors is intended to be kind of pejorative. Uh, as like uh, kind of like um, political correctness is a term that was invented to really mock a position <laughs> um, rather than something that people would self-identify that way as. But what I'm thinking about, what the reason I bring this up is that uh, usually people who use the term social justice warrior as like a derisive term for certain people um, are uh, really almost 
they they talk as though they're not interested in social justice um or they're somehow opposed to it or think that there shouldn't be emphasis on social justice or like this is a waste of time or it's bullshit or something like that um but the the point i always like to make about this is that most of the time their criticisms of people concerned with social justice or how they're mocked are actually for the parts of it that aren't just straight up name calling the parts that are that actually have any kind of substance to them are themselves social justice claims so there's really no way to to not have a position on social justice even if you are an anarchist you are having an, anarchy anarchy is um, anarchism is a uh, social justice position it's a it involves a picture of what a just society looks like um, and that's what social justice is about. But let me get even more specific about it. Um, social justice is a, is about not people anymore. We're not talking about people and their individual moral responsibilities or obligations. We're talking about a moral evaluation of institutions themselves. So justice concerns a lot of stuff. It concerns uh, individual liability but also uh, it does have this social justice part of it too, where we can apply the principles of justice to the context of systems, institutional systems. When we talked about affirmative action, I gave a distinction about something like prejudice, like say racial animus or something like that, like attitudes of hatred or bigotry or something like that versus um, system uh, systems of inequality so ways in which people are treated in unequal ways even if there's no animus or bigotry involved on the part of any individual person um, I'm not sure if I brought this up in the video lecture I know I definitely talked about it in the 260 my 260 section but there was a, a book written um, recently it was kind of about uh, it was mostly just presenting a lot of research and statistics about inequality in America specifically racial inequality and I think the tagline for the book was um, racism without racists and that's kind of getting at this kind of distinction now there, there's a difference between what individual people are doing and their virtue or whether their actions have violated other people's rights or stuff like that and how we evaluate how systems are treating people and social justice is in that territory about the institutional systems themselves so in the context of business ethics what we're interested in with this topic about social and economic justice is really what's the justice of businesses themselves and the entire marketplace so like the entire system of society has an economic dimension to it and how is what's happening there on the economic side uh, a part of the justice of the entire system of society. So like I said, pretty big picture here, right? Pretty big scope to the conversation. I have a very good illustration beyond the racism stuff um, for talking about this. Um, how many people, um, anyone in chat know about the Title IX office at Bellevue College? I raise hands, but yeah. you can't see your hands. Anyone know about Title IX? Yeah, Walter? Mm -hmm. um, since you're here, Walter, I'll, I'll put the microphone up to my speakers. What, what does the Title IX office do? I think my microphone wasn't picking you up. So, uh, yeah, you're right. That it's about concerns related to discrimination, um, uh, sexual violence, um, sexual harassment, things like that, um, sexual assault, even um, hate crimes, all sorts of stuff. Um, and you're right that that's kind of the the subject matter of the moral concerns. But um, what would be the uh, what, what is the Title IX office responsible for, if I could put it that way?
And what what is their moral mandate? What drives them to do this? I'm just I'm kind of fishing here. Sorry if I got you on the spot, Walter. You you got the basic idea down. I mean, this is how Title IX wants to be understood for sure. Um, maybe maybe I'll, I'll stop being cagey about this. The um, so. I know the, the people who work in the Title IX office. Uh, I've talked with them on a few occasions. They are wonderful people. Um, I really, I think they're fantastic at, and they're doing their jobs very, very well. Um, and uh, they, but I was imagining like about what I'm about to say about them, that they might bristle a little bit at what I'm about to say. But I'm gonna put it in kind of the stark terms to make a point. The Title IX office is not about students it's not about victims and that's what they might be like Ugh! like no of course they are like of course they're concerned about the students the whole reason for title IX is to be concerned about the students but the concern for students is not what would justify the kind of legal status that the title IX office has or wields so to speak they're mandated by the government to be a part of the college in order for the college to protect its moral accountability. So this is uh, the Title IX office gets its mandate from having to protect the moral integrity and the moral legitimacy of the college itself. And it's not about uh, protecting victims, so, so to speak. But the reason why we're concerned about all this is because of the students. Um, Title IX mandated, or basically made, institutions liable for what happens to their students. Now, we've got to be really careful about how to understand this, um, because let, let's say, I'll, I'll use an example here. Let's say um, a student at Bellevue College uh, uh, does some kind of unjust act toward another student. He violates their rights, does some discrimination, maybe assault, something like this, right? There's some... Um, some individual act that they perpetrate that they that is unjust okay and it falls under the kind of uh, rubric of justice concerns that that title IX is about right discrimination sexual harassment things in that ballpark um, the school is not responsible or doesn't take on the moral responsibility of the violator here Okay, that violator has considerations of justice that attach to them as an individual person, and when they don't fulfill their moral obligations by like violating other people's rights, that's on them. Right? They they are personally morally liable for that. But what the school is responsible for, and legally responsible for, is ensuring that students who come to the college are in a learning environment which is healthy for them. And things like discrimination, harassment, get in the way of equal access to education. They stop people from wanting to go to school at all uh, or are huge distractions for a person being able to be a student. Or in the really extreme cases, the kind of personal harm that's involved with it might have effects not just related to their ability to participate in school, but with a lot of things in life, right? They can create huge amounts of complications for them. So the school has a responsibility as an institution to create a learning environment that serves all of the students. Okay? That's why Title IX exists. That even if the school, like the school needs to, there's kind of two ways in which they're liable. One, they need, they need to do everything in their power to prevent these kinds of things from happening. So doing things like um, Mm, advertising these kinds of concerns or that the office exists or that there's support areas to like let people know hey this is not okay here are the expectations for what it is to be a student at Bellevue College these sorts of things are not um, acceptable right so there's this kind of preventative side but then the other thing about why the title IX office like takes up cases and investigates and that kind of thing is about when these things happen the school has an obligation or responsibility in how to respond to that injustice occurring. And if the school is not responsible there either, then they are sort of involved or culpable in their own kind of injustice, okay? institutional injustice. So that's why Title IX exists. 
it's uh, and it helps to maybe get the contrast here between just plain old vanilla justice with a capital J and social justice when it comes to big picture justice umbrella justice that includes social justice but it also includes people's individual moral responsibilities when we're talking about social justice we're talking about what's happening with institutions and how they're set up and how they run. So for Bellevue College to not have a Title IX office means that it's not functioning in a certain way that it is supposed to function in. And that doesn't mean that like nothing bad ever happens. There's always going to be that kind of risk. Um, but the school has responsibilities for what to do about that, right? What to do to mitigate the risk and when things happen to respond to them in a just way, in a, in a morally ideal way. Chat, how is, is this making sense? You can see the contrast here of, of what the object of evaluation is in social justice. Okay, cool. Thank you, Tyler. I appreciate the feedback. I mean, one, one big misconception, just get right out of the way, is that a focus on social justice doesn't take anything away from individual responsibility. Um, the responsibilities that attach to institutions is something in addition to individual responsibility. Um, it's just on a different level. Um, institutions are not the product of a single person's actions, so they can't be like put all onto one person or something like that as what they're responsible for. Um, and those systems kind of have their own dimensions regardless of the intentions of the people who do put them together. And that's what we're, we kind of are talking about. Um, the next um, big idea here is just to talk about what is society. So if we're talking about social justice, we're concerned about institutions. But what, how, how to understand what is society is worth cashing out a little bit here too. And while this definition might sound a little goofy to you, because you might not think that society really works this way, uh, it is still true even with the kind of cases that you might be thinking of as counterexamples. Um, what I mean here, or what I'm referring to, is the idea that society is a system of cooperation. And it may not always feel like that, but it is. Even when people are like antagonistically disposed toward each other, or there's conflict, there still is a system of cooperation going on in those moments. Otherwise, there wouldn't be an arena or a forum in which that disagreement could emerge or where the conflict could take place. Um, say, uh, here, here's another little example or demonstration I can give of this. Um, even if you imagine the business world as purely a matter of this like jungle of survival and prey and predator kind of thing, like eat or be eaten kind of uh, a moral mentality about the business world um, money itself is a system of cooperation even companies who are directly in competition with each other and trying to destroy each other are still all playing by the same rules they're all playing the same game and if you don't have people playing the same game then you don't have a system of cooperation money itself is a system of cooperation if we didn't cooperate with each other, money would be meaningless. Um, and that's actually one of the interesting points that's going to be relevant for Rawls here. Even people who don't have money need to be cooperating with the system of money and the rules by which it operates so that the people who do have the money can do something with it. If people who didn't have money didn't participate in it, you wouldn't have a monetary system. Um, that's probably a very strong claim, but if we're imagining... Um, basically the entire, let's say, the, the people who are living below the poverty line were just like, not doing this anymore, not participating in this. You would have pretty open social rebellion happening, right? And the, that would very much threaten the integrity of the system. And the only way it could probably survive is if it found some way to tighten the wagons and make a new circle of community that just excludes other people, right? But whatever is going to be a society is just any system of cooperation. It doesn't have to be as large as billions of people or millions of people or thousands of people. It could, you could have a system of cooperation <clears throat> as small as like a family. Or if any of you are working on like group projects this quarter, like your group project is a system of cooperation. 
even if it doesn't always feel cooperative. Um, it still is a little society for that reason. Um, how are we doing with that definition? I really wish I could see all of you. <laughs> um, there's a lot of like little pieces I want to put in place, and um, I want to make sure they're going good before I like go on to the next thing. Good? Good? Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Awesome. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. Really appreciate it. Um, so here's the next big idea. What is social justice about? Well, we already talked about how it's not really um, about legislating or controlling um, individual people's moral responsibility. In like the Title IX example, what Title IX is responsible for is what to do about something once it's happened and how to prevent stuff, how to like set up a system that is preventative too. That's what the system has responsibility for. Um, so it's not it's not a just a proxy for taking away individual responsibility or something like that. Um, but it has obligations to respond to that. So in the same way, and this is an idea we're going to come to close to the end of the Rawls lecture here today, um, there are aspects of life that are not the product of society. And there are probably some philosophers out there that are going to kind of take some issue with me about this. Um, there are some people who want to basically read social structures into just about everything in reality. Um, and it's true that you don't really get to escape society, but if we're thinking about the conditions of what's going on, um, the, the system of cooperation that's going on in society, while it touches on everything, is not fully determining everything. Um, people's positions, what's going on with them, um, their circumstances, their qualities, um, their character, uh, there's a lot of other, just physics, <laughs> there's a lot of variables here that operate independently of creating a system of cooperation. And uh, while social justice will be responsive to those sorts of things, it's not taking responsibility for those sorts of things. So Rawls puts it like this. He says, when it comes to equality, for example, um, people are just not equal. Like, that's just what happens. We're all different. We have different experiences. Um, we have different capabilities. Um, even if you wanted to sort of have some sort of system set up to make people equal, um, there isn't the same thing between someone being given a positive or negative handicap to put them in the same position as somebody else. That's a different situation than the person who doesn't have that handicap going on. Um, Rawls says that natural inequalities are neither just nor unjust. You're not entitled to them and you're not like blamable for them. Like if you're, like what genetics you're born with, that's not, that's not something that's a matter of social justice. What is a matter of social justice is how do we respond to the circumstance that we're not equal. So another kind of common thing that I've heard as uh, a kind of, I, I think somewhat superficial criticism of concerns about equality as a part of, of social justice is that people just aren't equal. So this is a fool's errand, like you shouldn't be trying to do this. And that's false. <laughs> I mean, and we'll see a lot, even, even Nozick's not going to agree with this. Um, there still is the need to figure out what response, if any, is appropriate to confronting that, those sets of circumstances. Do they factor in, in, and in what way are they relevant for considering how the system of cooperation should be set up? and whether that system is doing something just or unjust. Is it reflective of the values and principles of justice, or is it getting in the way of them? That's the real question here. So society can't control everything, and it's not going to try to, but there is what it has responsibility for. So what is, what, let's talk a little bit more about what that is, <clears throat> what that sort of space is. And so here's the next big idea. Um, if society is a system of cooperation, when you've got a system of cooperation, there are unique benefits and unique burdens. So uh, think, um, let's talk about the benefits first. Think about like what you could do individually all on your own and what I could do individually all on my own. If we get together and work together, there's going to be some efficiencies there that are more than the sum of just what you and I could do individually. 
in, in many, many cases. In certain cases, maybe not, but in many cases, yes. Um, that when we pool our resources, when we organize our efforts together with each other, then there's some extra benefit that's beyond just what we've, what is sort of our input to it or what we could have done on our own individually. And again, this takes a little bit of imagination because like I said a second ago, we can't really opt out of society at this point. That's not really feasible. Maybe in certain places in the world at certain times, uh, something like that was a live option, but it's not a live option anymore. Um, but we can still sort of imagine like, okay, what if you, you took away what this person would have been able to do on their own and you take away what this person would have done on your, their own. Whatever is left is like the, the benefit, the extra cream off the top that comes from the cooperation. So that cooperation is, has that added value, right? That increased value that wouldn't have been there without the cooperation. So those are the benefits. There's also burdens of cooperation. Um, every... Um, Every time you try to set up any kind of cooperative activity, there requires some organization to make that happen. Um, it's what we call bureaucracy, <laughs> and that takes effort um, to manage it. So even for something, I'm thinking of like a silly example here of uh, when I like host a board game night with my friends. So I have to organize that. I, at the very least, I gotta call people up, I gotta send emails, schedule a time that can work for people. Um, that is a cost of playing games with them, which is a cooperative activity. We're gonna ha we can have more fun together than if I just stayed home by myself playing solitaire games with myself, which I do sometimes do. Uh, there are solitaire board games and I play them when I don't have people to play with. Um, but man, it's so much more fun when you play with other people. There's extra value there that you don't get when you're just playing by yourself. But to set that up, has some cost. I've got to organize it. I got to figure out how we're going to eat dinner, like all that kind of stuff, right? So those burdens are also something extra than the burdens I would face if I was just living by myself off the grid in a shack in the woods somewhere. All right? So we can think life is going to be hard no matter what, but there might be some extra things that make it difficult when you're living life in a system of cooperation. Another way we can frame the question of social justice is what are going to be the parameters or the system that figures out the allocation of those benefits and burdens of cooperation. That's Social justice is a lot of that. Who's going to be holding the check, <laughs> so to speak? Who's going to be, and, and maybe how we split it up, how we share the burdens of organizing cooperation, and how do we distribute the benefits, the extra you know, whatever we get out of working together, okay? Um, how's this idea going? Good? It's really important to mention, this whole way of looking at things is not something that only applies to socialists or communists or something like that. As I was mentioning, Capitalism itself, just having a monetary system, is socialist in that sort of sense, right? It's a system of cooperation that if everyone's not playing by the same rules, it doesn't work, right? Even a barter system is a kind of system of organization. Anarchy is a system of organization. It's just one that doesn't have any rules to it, right? But that's the rule. The rule is the vision of... Uh, for the anarchist of how society justly should be is one in which there are no regulating principles whatsoever. Right? That's what the anarchist holds for. Oh, the connection was bad. It's okay. Oops. Sorry about that. Any, any, uh, everyone else doing good? Any other questions popping up so far in the lecture? Cool. Awesome. And I don't think I, I've mentioned it in a couple places where I'm like, maybe someone might disagree with me about this, that, or the other thing. But the, the big picture ideas that I'm throwing down here are really not controversial. 
there's there is going to be some pretty intense disagreement about social justice like uh, as you probably are aware um i mean politics is a matter of social justice right uh it's about the government is like the premier social institution that regulates our system of cooperation um but the economy is another one and business entities are institutional systems as well and they have the similar kind of influence um, they have a similar role to play in reality as the government does um, not exactly the same slightly different mandates and powers and stuff like that but um, just like we were able to talk about social contract theory as a theory of business ethics when originally social contract theory is brought up by philosophers as part of a uh, political philosophy of like how to know whether governments are just um, these things are, are really related. There's a reason why we can use that theory for both sorts of things. They're that same kind of entity, a system of rules and policies and procedures that regulate social cooperation. They both do that. Company having a policy is applying to their community. Like I was saying, you can have a society of just your family, right? Your family has some rules <laughs> about how to organize, even if some of them are maybe unwritten or you know, implied. There still is a system of how things work. You've got a culture in your family. It's different from maybe the people living right next to you on the block. Um, but yeah, they, it, this applies at all those kinds of levels. Any kind of system of, of social cooperation. Okay, so this is, this is kind of the big picture framing for the topic of social justice itself. Now let's start narrowing it down, getting closer and closer to what Rawls is up to. So, and I'm gonna, we're, we're not gonna go straight to Rawls right now. I'm gonna do another intermediary because Rawls is offering a social contract theory of social justice, okay? So the way he wants to attack the questions of social justice is with the kind of uh, theoretical strategy or rubric that you get from social contract theorists. And we did a little bit of social contract theory um, with Hasnas back with fiduciary duty weeks ago. Um, but I want to talk about it in a little bit more detail, and I actually want to talk about, um, uh, I'm, I want to use this as another example, another social contract. And and so some of this might be a little bit of a refresher, but it, it's worth, I think, doing that um, to get us set up here for understanding what kind of thing Rawls is up to. Um, and, yeah, the um, just as a recap here, social contract theories are basically saying we should live as if this sort of fictional contract had happened. Remember from Hasnas, we said social contracts are not about actual contracts, <clears throat> whether they're implicit or explicit. Um, they're about quasi-contracts, totally fictional things. Um, if you were born in the United States, uh, you didn't set up some sort of agreement with the United States about becoming a U.S. citizen. It just happened. You didn't get to choose it just sort of occurred um, maybe by extension by your parents choices to live here you know that something like that but they might have been born here too and they just got kind of like glommed in um, <clears throat> so it's not like you and the government sat down and the, and you're like okay government here are my terms if you protect human rights and don't violate principles of justice with respect to your citizens and operate in a way that brings benefit and well-being to the citizens as long as you're doing that, then I agree to obey your authority. And the government is like, deal. That never happened, right? <laughs> they didn't sign a contract about it. Now, if you, uh, if you applied for citizenship here as, say, an immigrant, then that's a little different story, right? There was some kind of explicit um, conversation here about that. The government has to agree to grant you citizenship. You need to freely consent to becoming a citizen. You can't. The government can't just make you a citizen without your choice. When it, when we're talking about with adults here, uh, that weren't born citizens, um, <clears throat> so you can't imagine that kind of thing happening. But it's not required. That's the point of social contracts, is that there doesn't have to be an actual agreement here. The government still, as a matter of morality, as a matter of social justice, owes certain things to people. To, to, to people in society. And if it's violating those terms, then it loses its moral legitimacy as a social institution. And if you think back to, uh, well, I gave that example about Title IX, right? The Title IX office at Bellevue College is here to protect the moral legitimacy of Bellevue College. And, and it's about serving students. It's about 
what happens to them, being concerned about them. But like I said, the main mandate for the Title IX office is to protect the moral legitimacy of the college. It's not just individual people like <clears throat> administrators, the president or something that are on the hook here legally. It's the entire institution of Bellevue College. And the same thing with businesses. Um, social contract theory applied to businesses like, if you remember from Hasnas, that here are the same terms on which society allows the business entity to exist. Businesses do not have intrinsic moral legitimacy to them. Society, under social contract theory, gives them their moral legitimacy. And if they don't violate their end of the deal, or if they do violate their end of the deal, then they lose their legitimacy and so society can basically say, get out of here, which is what happens. Uh, the U U.S. government does dissolve companies. It usually takes very egregious cases, and there's tons of cases where the government would probably be within their rights to do this, and they just don't do it. The government's pretty conservative about dissolving companies. But there are certain cases in which that happens, um, where the violations are so serious um, that the, com the government is basically like, we don't recognize your business license anymore. You can't participate in our economy. Boom. And if a government does this, right, if government is the source of accountability for the businesses, but if the government is not upholding its end of the deal, or say not fairly or appropriately regulating the business sectors, whatever it is, if the government's not doing its job, then in the words of uh, Locke, civil disobedience. Citizens should not only not respect the government anymore, but maybe even take steps to get rid of it, to undermine its power and its control over society because it's not doing its moral job anymore. That there's like Locke conceives of uh, there being a kind of moral obligation that citizens have to resist an unjust government, right? So um, the moral legitimacy of institutions are guilty until proven innocent. They're really always under conditional legitimacy. People are different. The way we handle people with justice is not this way. We think innocent until proven guilty is the right thing to do, but that's be out of respect for the inherent moral dignity of people. Think Kant or Gewirth or you know all the stuff about human rights we just got done with. Um, institutions are not people. <laughs> they don't have intrinsic moral dignity, um, so they don't deserve the, that kind of deferential status. Um, now, we tend to assume in a de facto sort of way that businesses are more or less fine, right? Because, But that's just because they're familiar to us, and they're playing a game that is also familiar to us. But when it really comes down to it, um, <clears throat> their status under social justice is really contingent and conditional. And if they're not holding up their end of the bar bargain, then they lose their legitimacy there. So this is um, this is a fictional sort of thing that social contract theories are setting up. Now, to really emphasize that fictional point, what are the terms of legitimacy here? Uh, every social contract theory needs to give a theory about that. They need to tell some justification story about why those conditions, right? Why the conditions that you heard from Hasnas talking about, here's what social contract theories do. And I want to give you an example of another social contract theory. It's different from Rawls. Um, but it'll, it'll kind of give you an idea of like what's going on with the whole social contract theoretical strategy, like what's kind of going on underneath the hood here. And every, theor every social contract theory has some kind of mention of an original position, um, some kind of fictionalized setting, like this imaginary thing of you and the government sitting down and writing a contract or something, coming to an agreement. Um, or but it's going to be something like this that maybe has never happened or never will happen or never could have happened, but it doesn't matter. Um, this, can, this situation is supposed to highlight what are the reasons that end up setting a mandate for how society ought to run. So the basic idea is whatever reasons you have or people would have for allowing societies to exist at all, systems of cooperation, sort of sets the mandate for whether those systems are doing what they're supposed to do by justice or not. So let's talk about Hobbes. Hobbes is a very famous social contract theorist. Anyone in chat ever read Hobbes before? Study Hobbes? The Leviathan? 
Is that familiar to anyone? Nope. Nope. Hobbes, Rousseau, these are some of the early modern philosophers who really got on this whole social contract idea. Um, Hobbes has his own original position, um, what he calls a state of nature. So he imagines a world without any system of cooperation whatsoever. Like, and maybe this happened, maybe it didn't, it doesn't really matter. Um, what, in that circumstance, it's basically rule of the strong, right? There's no cops, there's no laws, there's no accountability, it's pure anarchy, it's not even anarchy as a system, nothing like that. Not an anarcho-commune or something like this. Um, it's, it's really like a post-apocalyptic kind of situation. And people who have power get to do what they want. People who don't have power don't get to do what they want. And it sucks kind of all around, Hobbes says. I mean, I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but it sucks all around. If you're a weak person, it sucks because strong people are just going to take advantage of you. Right? What, and whatever dimension of strength we're talking about, whatever way in which people are able to take advantage of each other, that can happen. You're vulnerable to that. But even for the strong people, it sucks. There's always maybe another strong person around, right? Even if you've got your own little like domain here that you can defend against everybody else, it's like you're always kind of looking over your shoulder all the time. Um, nasty, brutish, and short, I think that's a, I don't know if that's a quote from Hobbes or someone commenting on Hobbes, but that's the sort of situation, famous quote, um, life in this sort of arrangement is nasty, brutish, and short. That it really doesn't have a lot of good things in it. Um, you're able to get some things like basic survival becomes the main game in town, right? Just making making a, a livelihood for yourself somehow. Um, but this isn't a this isn't a, a life of dignity and satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, there are some people who seem attracted to this. I'm always a little confused by that. Um, I think maybe they're ignoring certain possible other values or they're so fed up with all the burdens of social cooperation that they imagine that there would be more freedom or more value or meaning if they were off the grid entirely and didn't have to deal with other people and they like they wouldn't mind having to just play this brutal game of survival or something like that but i'm usually pretty suspicious of that if that's you if you're like yeah sign me up i that sounds like a great time i'd much prefer that to this bullshit um i'd love to talk to you about that it's a very interesting debate i'm i'm somewhat skeptical that people really believe that, that they would really say yes to something like that. Um, but Hobbes doesn't think we will. Hobbes thinks we're going to very quickly figure out this isn't the best way to do things. And if there wasn't the dangers involved, or the practical things, again, you don't have to imagine this as if it was a real situation. Just if you were living in that situation uh, or facing those kinds of conditions, why would making a society look attractive? What reasons would you com would compel you to do it? Well, the real big one is security, safety, and peace. That basically uh, Hobbes thinks, and actually this idea goes dates all the way back to Plato. Plato has an interesting argument in the Republic that's pretty much exactly the same thing as what Hobbes says, um, except all Hobbes wants tyranny. That's a whole other thing. But um, that you would um, be willing to trade the opportunity to exploit other people in order to gain the protection from them exploiting you. That that's like, that's the rational trade. Rational self-interest would recommend signing up for that. Right? And that's what society lets you have. I mean, once you've got that system of cooperation, you can have cops, you can have a justice system, there's some authority here. Um, you, you have to have an institutional entity with a monopoly on violence in a region, and then it can provide peace. Um, that's kind of the logic of how this works. Um, so you trade that. And there's a lot of other benefits you get, not just freedom and peace and security, uh, freedom from having to worry all the time about people coming around and killing you and taking all your stuff, um, but you also get to uh, enjoy certain other benefits that only come from social contact with other humans, um, the kinds of relationships that we can have with each other when we're not looking over our shoulder, well, are you gonna? We're having a meal right now, but are, as soon as I fall asleep, are you gonna stab me and take my stuff, kind of thing, right? Um, it's different. There's other opportunities for, say, intimacy, meaningful relationships, um, for learning from each other, uh, the cooperative truth-seeking project, 
um, all sorts of things. There, we can be more efficient with our labor. Um, it's it's civilization that allows for some of the greatest human accomplishments that we've made. Um, so Hobbes thinks th it's a pretty easy sell here. But those sorts of reasons that get us into society set a moral mandate for what has to be going on in order for society to kind of be morally legitimate. As soon as society is no longer serving those functions anymore of enabling those things to happen, then it would be like, why participate in it? Like, this was not something we had to do, right? We we're imagining this as a kind of choice. Um, so that, that kind of setup of like, some state of nature or original position in which we're considering what are the reasons why we would participate in a system of cooperation in the first place. That's what sort of characterizes all social contract theories, including Rawls. Now Rawls isn't going to do this the way Hobbes does it, um, but it's going to it's going to have some of those earmarks. It's going to have some of those similarities. Um, one big big element that is similar here. I'm I'm just looking at my lecture notes here really quickly. Yep, talked about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, let me read you this quote. So this is from Rawls. Um, Under a theory of social contract, uh, justice will be determined as those principles that free and rational persons, concerned to further their own interests, which is a really interesting addition, we'll talk about that later, would accept in an initial position of equality, what Rawls is going to call the original position, as defining the fundamental terms of their association. So Hobbes does this a little different because um, it doesn't necessarily require the equality thing, but he is imagining this position where it's like, okay, say society was a choice, what would be the reasons? Why would rational people choose to involve themselves in a society? Okay, Why would they do that? And those will be, whatever those reasons are, will act as kind of regulative principles for how society ought to look, whether it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, uh, whether it's ideal. Okay, so... Um, another really important idea here, these regulatory principles. Um, and the idea of the social contract itself, which still uses the metaphor of a contract, right? Um, and uh, as a callback again to the theme about how social contracts are quasi-contracts, they're fictional things here, right? There's going to be a major distinction between whatever are the contracts or agreements of the social contract and the sort of day-to-day uh, -day negotiations that we make. So what are the kind of considerations of people having a negotiation about how to set up society um, are different. That's on a different level than the stuff that we're doing when we're like, do I want to buy this product or not? Or should these companies merge? Or, you know, all those kinds of negotiations that happen in the market. People um, haggling over a price in the marketplace or something, right? The social contract doesn't legislate all that. What the social contract does is sort of lay the ground rules. Um, principles of social justice are the ground rules, the sort of rules for engagement that then set the terms on which all the other interactions can happen. All the other negotiations, all the other contracts are kind of held under the auspices of the rules of how society is set up. Okay, so, and that's the same for the principles of a just society. Um, they're not getting it all the way down to the most minuscule detailed choice. This isn't like uh, a theory like utilitarianism, which is telling you, you know, just turn the crank on this, apply, you know, uh, apply the circumstances to the principle of utility, turn the crank, and here's the action you're supposed to do. Um, this, is, uh, this has a separation of scale here. And one of the best metaphors that I have for explaining this kind of disconnect um, I mean, they're related to each other, but there's one's on a different order than the other. It's kind of like um, playing a board game. So I've been, I guess tonight's board game night, because I'm talking about board games a lot. But you got a rule book, right? The rule book sets the rules of the system of cooperation. And it could be an antagonistic game, right? It could be a competitive game. But if we aren't playing by the same rules, then we're not playing the same game. We're not playing a game if we're not playing by the same rules. But the rules don't tell you what to do on your turn. They set what your options are. They put restrictions on how you can move your pieces or what you can do with the resources you have or something like that or what kind of conditions you have to meet before you can do this other kind of action. Um, they set the parameters of what is possible, but they don't tell you what to do. 
And that's what social justice principles are like. They set the terms on how people are justly able to interact with each other. Um, and that's what, that's what we're evaluating, is that set of rules. The, that's what social institutions are. Even when we're talking about culture, too. Culture is also a social institution, just a very informal one. It's like the, un, the unwritten rules of society uh, make up a, a part of, they're part of what a culture is. Um, okay, so the difference between the terms of the social contract is sort of setting or creating the space in which any other interactions are possible, but they condition what's allowable there, okay? And then there's still going to be other negotiations that make. But here's the here's the other kind of big idea I'm getting for, and then and then we're kind of we're getting to a culminating point here, and then I can get in the actual details of Rawls. It is crucial for any social contract to emphasize that the actual agreements that people make with each other do not set the rules of engagement. They do not set the principles of social justice. They cannot define the principles of social justice. In other words, the contracts that we ought to see ourselves as being under are in no way conditioned by what people actually agree to. That's true for every social contract theory, including democracy. So let's use democracy as an example here. Again, this is kind of on the political scale, but it's going to work. In a democracy, we sort of are set in one way saying that, right? That we're, I mean, on paper, what's supposed to happen here is that depending on how people actually vote, that's going to determine the rules for the framework of how our society is going to function. What this, what are going to be the rules and principles of this system of cooperation. But notice, democracy only works because you've got a system of rules that say the rules will be determined by the votes. If you didn't have that, uh, you don't get democracy, <laughs> right? Um, that rule would be, or that the action of voting would be completely meaningless if there weren't rules set up that say whatever is the outcome of the vote is going to determine what happens. So even like democracy itself is not institutionless. It's not systemless. It's definitely not anarchy, right? And sometimes I think that gets forgotten in some of the political conversations that happen today. Um, even Nozick, who is a hardcore libertarian, is going to be in complete agreement with everything I just said. And he's like, yes, of course. The whole conversation of social justice is setting up what are the rules about how things are going to happen, even if what we're trying to do with setting up those rules is maximizing how much people have personal autonomy within that framework, right, to give the maximum number of options. Okay, um, but that's still, in order to have options, in order to have freedoms, you need to have a system, an enforceable system, that sets up rules that gives you that kind of spaciousness. So people who want to blow up the government and think they'd have more freedom, nope, wouldn't happen, right? There wouldn't be anything to protect your freedoms anymore, right? Then we'd be back to state of nature the way Hobbes is talking about, right? And then it's just it just reduces to power, pure power, and there's no morality there. So we can't think that what people actually agree to is going to determine what they ought to have agreed to or what would be a just arrangement or something like that. To set the real foundations here, the, the, the rules for engagement, we have to go someplace else. And that's why all these social contract theories are trying to imagine some idealized setting in which rational people are thinking about what to do in creating society. Okay? I don't think Hobbes does a very good job of this. Um, maybe Rawls does a better job of avoiding some of the pitfalls, especially a bias, that can come out of this. But what we're definitely worried about, what all social contract theorists are worried about, is a situation where um, we shouldn't be respecting even consensual agreements if those consensual agreements are only being made because of power and coercion, right? So if, you, if uh, I'm able to leverage my power over you um, to get a result to happen that you agree to, that doesn't mean we have a just arrangement or that that's, that's, uh, we've made the contract that then is going to set the social contract. The social contract can't get its authority from actual contracts. It has to be above that because it's the social contract, those rules, that are going to determine whether the contracts we're making are actually just. The actual contracts are subject to it, not it subject to our actual contracts. Got to get that in the, the right order there. Okay, how's this going? I just talked about a lot of big stuff. 
Um, I want to check in with everyone and see how we're doing. That was a very loaded hour of lecture, I, in my opinion. Um, maybe this just went by and you're like, yep, 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 but maybe not. And I want to know about that, maybe not. Aha, interesting, Tyler. Drew a lot of parallels from uh, your military service on a submarine. Systems of cooperation is definitely something that the military is tracking very closely, regardless of whether you think they're doing the best job of it or not. It's definitely something that they are keenly focused on. <laughs> yeah, how we had to develop our own little societies inside the sub with our own rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and that's a part of the concern here of the social contract theorist, that you had to work something out. But maybe the arrangement that you made with each other in that submarine was arrived at maybe through some inequalities, right? Maybe because of how some people are able to leverage a position over somebody else. Um, maybe not. Maybe you could do it on, on different sorts of grounds. That's definitely the, the dream here. Um, but definitely there's a risk of that, right? In some cases, that was a definite issue, yes. People get catty with each other pretty fast, right? And then they start getting manipulative, looking out for themselves, and not thinking about their actions in the context of a system of cooperation, all that good stuff. Um, I don't know uh, if any of you um, know much about uh, New England Transcendentalism. It was a sort of an intellectual cultural movement in the 19th century in New England, um, so Northeastern America. Um, and basic, uh, Emerson and Thoreau are in this circle of intellectuals. And there were a lot of attempts at utopian communes of like uh, within this circle of people. A lot of people trying to set up, um, get away from the rest of the system of society and make their own little society that they thought were they were going to be able to do a better job with. You know, there was more intentional community um, based on different values and principles. Um, and almost all of them fail. And I don't think that that's itself proof against any the attempt or, or doing something like this. I've actually seen a lot of communities like this succeed firsthand. Um, but there's a lot of famous cases of this blowing up. And some of it is that people just aren't prepared for handling the unique, not only benefits, but also burdens of social cooperation. And people can easily start operating in the anti-social way and undermining the strength of that community by not operating in a in a way that's thinking about the system as something that needs to be protected and preserved based on the moral mandate that's created from it so so yeah we we always want to be able to have some accountability that goes beyond just what can we get people to agree to or consent to right like for example um, very clear injustice would happen if I tried to blackmail you by saying I'm controlling your grades for this class right if I was like you know Bellevue College isn't paying me enough so I'm gonna start saying any student who gives me 50 bucks I'll give an A if you give me 20 bucks I'll give you a B if you don't give me anything I'm gonna give you a D that would be pretty unjust right I might be able to get you to agree to it but it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right just because you agreed and that's the basic idea of how we shouldn't have the social contract being set by actual contracts. There's big concerns about power differential, uh, power, uh, power, leveraging power to make consent happen, but that's not really moral consent. Um, that yeah, that happens often in your country, biscuit. Yeah, um, it does happen in many places in this world. Yep. Um, yeah, there is, um, my brother uh, taught in all over Asia for about six years, and he saw a lot of that firsthand, and, and families trying to be like, hey, I want my kid to do this. I want them to pass. There's something. And we're going to be like, nope, not playing that game. 
And then those parents hated him. <laughs> he got into some trouble for not, not playing ball that way. Um, it is convenient. Teaching is a service. That is true. It is a service, but not that kind of service. <laughs> yep. It doesn't mean anything if, if it's just, yeah, the bribe is the tip. <laughs> I've sometimes thought about putting a tip jar, but yeah, that's, that's not cool. Um, I'm like, other prof you know, your coffee barista, you know, gets tips. Why can't I give a tip? You like my lecture? Thought it w you got something out of it? Yeah, show me a tip. Yeah. But no, I'm not soliciting any tips or bribes. I want to make that absolutely clear. Th but it's just a clear case of even if I could get you to agree to something like that, that wouldn't make it a just arrangement. Um, and even in societies like ours, like free enterprise societies, Think back to Hosnos where he's like, consent really matters. There's something morally important, and society ought to respect what people freely choose to do with each other. There is some moral weight to that, but that moral weight gets undermined with the presence of coercion, leveraged power, biases. Um, so we're concerned about that. Rawls has got a strategy for overcoming those problems. Um, so we'll take a look at that. Uh, maybe after we take a break now. Any any other questions, um, comments from chat here before we, we go for a little break? Kind of wrapping up the whole first half of the lecture tonight. Cool. We're not doing Nozick tonight. We'll do Nozick next week. I might start Nozick. I don't know. I, I think we'll we'll probably be able to use the rest of the time tonight just on Rawls. Um, I've done a lot of setup to try to help us hit the ground running with Nozick when we get him on Tuesday. Okay, cool. Let's uh let's take a little break. Oh, oh. Okay, cool. Um we'll take a little break here and I'll be back in a little while. All right, so getting back into it here. Um, I think I, I just want to kind of drop something on the table that um, I already I already mentioned, but I'll I'll kind of mention again here. Um, so there, and I, I think this is kind of relevant for an American context, uh, American cultural context, with our rugged individualism and our sort of ideal of. Uh, a person being able to kind of operate independently on their own, pull themselves up from their bootstraps, the basic dignity of their individual agency and all that kind of stuff, which undoubtedly is true to us as far as it goes. I mean, the kind of Kantian uh, reflections on the importance of autonomy um, and individuality and human rights, I mean, it's all here. And Rawls has that incorporated into the model he's gonna be uh, proposing. But the idea that we can just sort of operate uh, independently of other people, as if what we're doing is completely our own actions, um, completely a matter of ourselves. Man, this light is crazy. I'm tr trying to help the situation. Let's see, maybe that's a little bit better. <laughs> the glare. Um, so uh, that's just a fiction. I mean, the fact that we don't need other people is something that we're only able to think of by ignoring basically everything that allows and empowers us to be able to do what we're able to do on our own. And a lot of times these systems are invisible. Um, America has a, a legacy, a cultural legacy that goes, that I think of especially as a touchstone here, uh, coming from the Cold War where like socialism and communism was sort of cast as independent or in contrast or in conflict with um, values of democracy and how closely democracy got tied up with capitalism. And you are going to see this, um, some of the logic of why those things might get identified with each other, especially from Nozick. Um, Nozick's, uh, his main reason for promoting free market economy kind of capitalism um, on moral grounds is as an extension of democracy. And you saw something like that kind of from Milton Friedman too. Um, but there's a lot of ways in which these systems are all around us and that 
I wouldn't be able to do anything on my own if it wasn't for the system of cooperation that is society. And there's a lot of things that are basically socialist, uh, although we don't usually think about them that way. Um, I've got all sorts of examples here to draw on. Um, as we keep going, I'll, I'll talk about uh, some examples. I mean, the military is actually a really good example. I think people who have served in the military kind of have a frame of reference for understanding a lot of the logic of social justice theories, especially social contract uh, theories of justice. Um, but also uh, insurance, banks, um, fire departments. Um, yep, <laughs> is that what you were just writing? Yep, yep, fire departments, uh, police themselves. Um, all, all these things are really kind of socialist. Right? that they, we get benefits, um, our quality of life is improved by our participation in a system of cooperation. People hate taxes because it feels like the government's stealing your money or something, but without the government and without society, without that framework of social institutions, your money is basically worthless. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything at all. We talked about the money thing itself as being a system of cooperation like this as well. Um, but uh, kind of getting into the where we get from Rawls here, jumping into this, again, the actual agreements don't dictate the, uh, they can't dictate the ground rules that are going to set up this system, a just system of social cooperation. Um, we, uh, the way Rawls is sort of thinking about this is we have to set those things up first before any of the other interactions can occur. And We've got some concerns here about um, how negotiations could backfire here. And like the title of, of Rawls's book is Justice as Fairness. And um, you remember the flute uh, example with the kids wanting to play with the flute? That comes from Amyarta Sen. Um, or Am, Amyarta, Amyarta, oh, I keep mispronouncing his name. Amarta, Amarta Sen. He's, he, he wrote a book on social justice, and it's basically like he is a fanboy of Rawls, but he thinks Rawls is wrong about some things. But he brings up that flute example at, in the preface to that book because he's like, what fairness is, is something we very much disagree about. And Rawls is going to have a detailed notion of this. He's not just throwing around fairness as some abstract, like, loosey-goosey principle here of moral appeal. Um, he's got a very detailed notion of it, and that's what we need to talk about. But I think we can get in the ballpark here by imagining what unfair negotiations could look like. And these are negotiations that are structured by power, and how power gets in the way of a condition that would be required for a just arrangement. So um, I'll give you one example here. Um, imagine uh, I'm looking for a new apartment, and I find you're looking for a new apartment, and we're like, if we pool our money, we can get a better apartment, right? If uh, This is kind of like the extra benefit that comes from social cooperation. There's some attractiveness to doing something together here. Um, but imagine that um, I'm like, well, what's the apartment I could get by myself versus the apartment I could live in if I had access to your income too, right, to help supplement paying for it. Um, but then we, we find an awesome apartment, but it only has one bedroom. And so I propose to you, hey, uh, how about we um, go together on this apartment and you can sleep in the closet and I'll take the bedroom. Would you agree to that? I know uh, Chad is not very responsive, but I'm pretty sure you'd say no. <laughs> that you'd be like, nope, that sounds terribly. Maybe. What do you think in Biscuit? What are the amenities included, Walter asks? Depends on how we split the rent. Okay, yeah, that could be. But if we I, I, we just do it as like we can split it 50-50 and that's how it's going to go. You'd be like, no. And what's going to happen to be able to get your agreement to it? We can take turns. That could be a way to do it, right? But there has to be some kind of system set up of how we're going to distribute the benefits of this cooperation and the burdens to get a just arrangement or a fair arrangement. And that's going to require mutual buy-in. 
there's got to be some reason why this proposal is something both of us find independently is a great arrangement. Now, when we're imagining this, uh, and the, probably the way that I just sort of set up the, the thought experiment just now, you're probably assuming that you and I are roughly equal in terms of power, right? That we're um, peers, you might say, in this. Um, but imagine it's not. What if I'm like blackmailing you in some way? Then I can get you to agree to an arrangement that really isn't advantageous for you, that all other things being equal, you wouldn't agree to. But you would agree, right? Um, I could use the money saved to travel because we may have to agree on you paying slightly more for the room since you're getting the room still a great deal, though. Um, yeah, so there, there could be some other payoffs here, some other way of making this arrangement something that can get your buy-in. Right? But again, if we want to make the, comp the case more complicated, it's still coming down to this principle about what can elicit the mutual buy-in. But when there is power inequality going on, then, the, then whether this is a fair arrangement seems to be compromised. And that's the kind of intuition um, that Rawls is sort of operating on here. Blackmailing is the act of power. Yes, that's exactly right, Biscuit. Yeah. So here's another example that kind of captures that setting. Um, let's say it's a recession and I have a factory. I own a factory. I've got jobs. You all need jobs. I know this law of supply and demand. I'm going to offer really low wages because I know I can get people to take them because it's the difference between starving or not. Now, does that seem fair? Better than nothing, right? And that's what you would probably, that's why you would agree. And that's what I'm taking advantage of in this situation. Exactly. Right. But would we say that's a fair arrangement? Probably not. If you think it's fair, it is actually. Biscuit, you think it's fair? No, it is fair. What's your reason? Merrill Lynch desperately agree upon uh, the shotgun shotgun marriage with Bank of America for fifty billion dollars. You're talking about two thousand eight or file bankruptcy? Yeah, that that's out of uh, their powerlessness that they would agree to this, right? And that that kind of case has got yeah 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 dirt cheap. That's right. Um, there's uh, a lot of other factors that complicate that situation in terms of thinking about social justice, so it may not be the best, like, toy example for us to play around with. Um, but especially when we're thinking about this as um, a, an entire system that enables this kind of thing to happen, is that the best way for how the rules are going to be for who gets the power to make these kinds of decisions? When we've got, I mean, a lot of times I think people find these situations fair because the rules themselves are being taken for granted. And everyone's playing by the same rules, right? The rules are universal to everybody. Um, same rules for everyone. Think fair in that sort of sense. But what if we're talking about being able to reconsider the rules themselves, whether those are up for negotiation? We don't think that just power itself should dictate how that's going to go not all by itself. And that's what Rawls is kind of concerned about here too. And it goes a little deeper than this. And I'm actually going to skip around in my lecture a little bit. I was going to do something else first and I was going to do something else later. But let, let's talk, let's get into the justification for Rawls's way of setting up his version of the original position. Like Hobbes had his state of nature, Rawls has his own version of this. And let's talk about the reasons why or where, where is Rawls sort of coming from in trying to set up this imaginary 
setting for a social contract. I think I think this is how Rawls approaches it. He looks at this debate around social justice. And the, the classic debate around social justice is a debate between libertarians and social liberals. We'll hear, we're here that we'll hear about this from the other two authors as well. Um, libertarians are defined by prioritizing a, a moral value on freedom and autonomy over people's well-being or um, sort of equality in society in terms of people's positions. Um, the, the freedom stuff matters more than the well-being. Libertarians are going to say well-being matters too, but when the shit hits the fan and you got to choose one thing or the other, you can't have your cake and eat it too, libertarians are going to prioritize freedom considerations over well-being. The social liberals flip that. Um, when the shit hits the fan and they can't have their cake and eat it too, they're going to prioritize people's well-being over freedoms. So you're going to have more regulations, more restrictions on what people are able to do, higher taxes, things like that, in order to create programs that improve people's well-being. So socialism goes in this sort of direction. And that's a classic debate. I am sure you've encountered this kind of clash of ideology or clash of worldview of, of moral values uh, because it is just all over politics in America. And when Rawls looks at that debate, he's skeptical of both sides. He's wondering, how can you have uh, a rational argument to defend a conception of social justice? And he's worried that the debates that we have, that what all too often happens, and I have to say in my experience, I see the pattern that you're picking up on here, um, you've got people who already have a lot of money and power in society opting for libertarian values, for a libertarian conception of social justice. The society is just when it's giving maximum freedoms to its citizens, even at the cost of some people falling through the cracks and uh, of well-being, higher poverty, higher unemployment. That's fine um, because we're letting people do what they want with what they have um, to protect their, their liberty, their autonomy. Um, why would someone who already has power and already has wealth want, why would that be in their self-interest? to subscribe to that conception of social justice? Well, because it lets them do more with what they have. It lets them have more power and more advantage. And the same thing Rawls thinks is true on the other side, that if you don't have a lot of power or you don't have a lot of wealth, then um, liberalism, social liberalism or socialism will look really attractive to you as a conception of social justice because it's going to distribute resources to benefit you in your position. So there's a, there's a self-interested motive for agreeing to that. And Rawls is really, really, really concerned about this. I mean, this is the same thing that concerns all the moral philosophers that we've looked at this quarter, though, uh, especially the ones working, uh, like, um, especially Kant and Mill from the Crash Course of Ethical Theory. Really worried about bias. How could we have a rational argument that will really justify these values as being better than any other value system that we might set up? Um, and they're looking for universal considerations here that will justify one theory over the other ones. Okay, So big, big concern about bias here. And particularly around self-interest. Um, both Kant and Mill had that pretty firmly on their radar. They have arguments against egoism as a way of, of life. And Rawls is thinking about, he, he's thinking about that same problem. But I remember I mentioned earlier when I, I read that quote to you. Here's the quote again. Um, Justice will be determined, social justice will be determined, as those principles that free and rational persons concerned to further their own interests, I highlighted that, would accept in an initial position of equality, the original position, which we're going to talk about next, as defining the fundamental terms of their association that lays the ground rules for all other interaction and cooperative participation. So he keeps in the part about self-interest. Rawls does something very interesting. Uh, he's very influenced by Kant here. Um, in many ways, Rawls' original position thought experiment is getting you to think in the same way you have to think when you're trying to universalize a maxim without contradiction in Kant. Um, you remember when we did that example with um, the homeless person that you're passing on the street, and you're like, well, I'm not going to hurt this person, but I don't have to help them. But then can I universalize that maxim without contradiction? And Kant's like, nope because you're going to get in a contradiction in your will. 
that if you were in a different position, if you were the person who is in need, who needs help, and there's another person who can help and it's not going to hurt them um, to help you, then you would will for them to help you. So you're going to get a contradiction in your will there. So you, whenever you're thinking about a moral principle or maxim that you would act on, you have to imagine, can I, do I have rational grounds for approving or willing this principle from all possible positions that I might be in, not just the ones I'm currently in. And that's what Rawls is concerned about here too with the bias of our, our, our individual positions that are contingent and different from each other, our circumstantial position, as making certain conceptions of social justice more attractive to us or make more sense to us um, than others, but that's really just a kind of bias of selfishness. Now Kant's answer, more or less, uh, and this is why I kind of think he's a secret Buddhist, is basically to encourage people to be egoless. Um, the whole idea of acting on pure reason in universalizable principles means I got to think outside of the box of my particular situation. And I have to basically have what I call Kantian empathy for people in different situations. I have to put myself in their shoes and imagine like, what if I was them? I need to detach from my own desires, right? Remember, I can't be operating on laws of inclination um, in order to be able to be moral. And that requires, uh, I've had some people respond to this before, this proposal from Kant is basically like, in order to be moral, we all need to be enlightened. Before we can talk about social justice, we basically have to have no egos. And to a certain extent, Rawls would say, yeah, except I think he's thinking, I, I do think that he thinks the Kantian attitude or approach to decision making and agency is truly ideal. That's a little bit of my speculation about this. I kind of think Rawls believes uh, he's not going to get a whole lot of converts because of this complaint about how like, oh my gosh, in order for me to be moral, I have to basically be an angel and I'm way down here. So yeah, I'm not going to try that. That's too impossible. That's impractical, blah, 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 blah. But Rawls is like, there's another way around the ego trap, the ego problem. And that's to basically neuter the ego. You don't have to take away people's self-interest in order for them to consider social justice. You just have to take away anything that you could run the ego engine on, specifically knowledge. Knowledge is the key here for Rawls, to take away the ability of people to know what are their contingent circumstances their circumstantial position. They can still be as self-interested as they like and will still get justice. It's, this is a very interesting move on Rawls' part. It's garnered a lot of philosophical conversation. Uh, this move has been a big move um, in, in sort of the discussions around Rawls' theory. But it's really clever. It's really interesting. So let's talk about what Rawls' original position is. But keep in mind that what he has in mind is that we are... We're going to define justice by what we would rationally agree to under a very special set of circumstances. Circumstances in which self-interest and power becomes irrelevant. And it's not that you have to take away the power, you just have to make it unapplicable. So I, I've talked a little, I think I mentioned way, way back when we did Hasnas, I gave a little short thing of like, here's what Rawls's thing is in like five seconds kind of thing. But let's go over it again maybe in a little bit more detail here. So Rawls is um, proposing an original position that's defined as a negotiating scenario under what he calls the veil of ignorance. And I've got my own little updated version of this. Maybe this is the story you remember me saying from before. Imagine all of our souls got sucked out of our bodies and we all go to the moon and we sit about around a big round table and we're gonna discuss and have a debate about how to set up the ground rules for society. What's going to be the basic framework for our system of cooperation in living with each other? And while we're up there, we don't know which person back down on Earth is us. We could be anybody. And by having that ignorance as to what your personal circumstances are, if someone's going to make a proposal in this conversation, I think we should set up society like this. I think we should do that. Your rational evaluation of the proposal because of your situation under the veil of ignorance, requires you to think about that proposal from every possible position of who you could be, right? You gotta think about, um, 
if I was wealthy, if I wasn't wealthy, if I was in a privileged social class, if I was in a disenfranchised social class. I mean, there, there's a whole laundry list here. I don't know my role under the veil of ignorance. I don't know my class. I don't know my status in society. I don't know what my personal property is. I don't know what my natural abilities are. I don't know what my perspectives or opinions on what is good, right? Like, what is my vision of the happy life? That differs from person to person. We've talked about that before. I don't know. I'm not aware of what that is. I don't know what my psychological propensities even are. I don't know any of this kind of information. I don't know what my religious status is, um, my gender status, anything like that. I don't have any knowledge of those things. So I need to imagine, like, I could be this person. How would that person feel about agreeing to this proposal? What about this person? What about this person? And there's a lot of ways in which what actually happens in our society does this a little bit. Especially when you're thinking about, like, the context of a family or a small group project I brought up earlier or um, a team, like a sports team or something like this. Like, we do this a little bit of, like, stepping into each other's shoes empathically and trying to be like, yeah, what would make sense for you? Like, I want this to work for both of us. I want this to be a win-win scenario, right? But a lot of times we engage in that while ignoring other people and maybe whole classes of people, that we don't think of them as being in our community. Tribalism and the, the moral dangers of tribalism, I think, are diagnosable through a Rawlsian framework here. That basically, yeah, we're thinking about some people in a compassionate, empathetic, win-win sort of way, but not all people. But if you're under the veil of ignorance, you don't even know, you don't know what your community identities are. You don't know what tribe you're a part of or, or the people that you're going to sympathize more with. You are forced to have to consider everybody. So Rawls thinks whatever we would agree to under the original position, whatever would be rational to agree to under that position, that's what's going to be moral. That's what's going to be socially just. So this is another way in which Rawls is very, very similar to what's going on in Kant's ethics. Kant came up with reason first as the precursor for the moral law. Think about his categorical imperative. The original formulation of it, even though it goes in, into really interesting territory later, I tell, like squeezing the blood from the stone thing, the stone that he starts with is just the law of non-contradiction, like the most basic component to formal logic. That's it. All right, that's his starting point. Um, for Kant, what's moral, what, is, uh, what it means to be free, and what it means to be moral, all the same thing. And Rawls is doing something very similar here. So whatever we would agree to in that original position will set the rules of social justice. So that's the, that's the first like really, really big thing here about Rawls and what he's up to, um, and how he's sort of setting the stage. We're going we're gonna to do the details of what he thinks we're going to agree to next, but um, I want to check in with everyone in the chat and see how this is going. I haven't seen any questions pop up yet. Um, it's going all right. Anything I can clarify? I'm going to keep talking here maybe while you think about that and type something into the chat. Um, oh, shoot. I just lost my train of thought. Um, mm. Mm. Dang it. I lost it. It's getting late. Dang it. Come on, Tim. Got to stay alive for just a little while longer. <laughs> More caffeine. Um, dang, what was I going to say? Uh, oh, right, right, right. Just as a reminder here about uh, the reason for all of this. Why engage in this thought experiment? <clears throat> the idea is that if we don't think about it this way, if we're not considering it from the position of the veil of ignorance, um, then there's a distinct chance here of bias. And is there still going to be bias? Well, yeah, because we can't actually recreate the veil of ignorance scenario, right? But we can think about it. I, I, I like to put it this way. A lot of people have complained. So that maybe I should turn my hat here. This is like me talking about Rawls, kind of actually a little bit of an apologist for him. A lot of people have complained about Rawls's proposal here is that it, it's just imp it's not helpful. Um, it's a nice idea in theory, but we can't ever execute on this. We can't detach ourselves from this, from our... our understanding of our situation. Um, and I think to a certain extent that's true. Um, there, This is an imaginary thought experiment, right? But in some ways I'm not so worried about this. Um, I think the real concern is not about whether you have 
this self-denial, right? That like you don't bring what you have to bring to the table here of like what do you see from your personal experience? Like how have systems affected you, right? That you can report on to everybody else. The key thing here is whether you're looking at what is going on with other people's situation and treating that as just as significant as the consideration of like what benefits me. Think about um, uh, JFK, right? in his inauguration speech where he says, um, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, right? Kind of like this isn't, your attitude about society is not just a matter of how can it benefit me in my present circumstances, but what is going on with the whole system, right? Where, what is the way in which I plug into this whole system of cooperation? Uh, did you guys all lose me? Tyler just sent me a, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. I think it was just a little hiccup in the Wi-Fi. Um, or I, I don't know if I talked about this to you. I definitely talked about this with my critical reasoning students this quarter. But a lot of times politics, de how democracy happens in America is people try to get your vote by showing you how a policy gives you an advantage, right? How it benefits you personally. That's not what the founding fathers had in mind. That's not the on paper theory of democracy is that basically whoever gets the most votes, their interests are met and everyone else can go sit on it or something, right? Um, the point is that we need democracy because we have disagreements about how to set up society to benefit everybody. So what are the values or principles that are for what's good for the country? Right? Not about just how can the entire system of cooperation serve to benefit me to my maximum advantage. That's not how democracy is supposed to work. And the more that it does work that way, the more that democracy is actually threatened and undermined. So I think Rawls is still really helpful here. Yeah, that's exactly the tactic candidates use. I mean, modern politics is all about what positions should I adopt as a candidate that are going to pull in the most votes from certain demographics, right? All the analytics that happen from people's preferences, that kind of thing. You're just pandering to certain audiences and you just need to pander to the right audiences so that you have the most votes and you win. But that's not what democracy is really supposed to be about. That's a twisted up version of it that is not in line with the social justice principles about how it's supposed to really work. So I think Rawls is helpful for this. When I'm thinking about like, a referendum that's on the ballot, I'm thinking not just how am I affected by this, but how are other people going to be affected by this? What, what's going to happen with them? And is this something that can elicit the buy-in of everybody? So this is the other really big idea from the original position for Rawls. The reason why there's authority, oh, sorry, I need to turn my hat back. Now I'm speaking as the, the, the teacher here who can teach you about what Rawls is saying. Um, whoop. Sorry about the noise. Um, uh, the authority of that decision comes from the fact that it's got the buy-in of everyone who's going to be participating in it. I mean, that's what Rawls is saying. The only fair arrangement for the system of cooperation of society is if everyone can buy into that. Uh, think back to a phrase I just used a couple minutes ago, the win-win. We're looking for a win-win arrangement. How can it not just be a win for me or just a win for you? But here's an, a, a proposed arrangement for how we coordinate that's a win for everybody. How do we, what proposal can elicit the rational buy-in from everybody? Um, here's another quote. The intuitive idea is that since everyone's well-being depends upon a scheme of cooperation without which no one could have a satisfactory life, maybe think back to Hobbes' State of Nature, or total anarchy, the division of advantages should be such, and we should probably say, the division of advantages and burdens, like right, both the benefits and burdens of social cooperation, the division of those, the distribution of those, should be such as to draw forth the willing cooperation of everyone taking part in it, including those less well situated. And this isn't just the willing cooperation imagining people's weakness of their negotiating position because of power differential, but under this place in which, under the original position, no one does have power over each other. They don't know who, what power they have, right? Yet this can be expected only if reasonable terms are proposed. Okay. All right. Um, I'm my 
uh, recording ticker it says I'm up to an hour and 40 minutes so I think um, to, I want to get through Rawls tonight we're gonna get there but I think it's about time we talk about the details um, I haven't seen any other big picture questions come up in the chat here um, definitely if you've got them put them in there as I keep going here I'm very interested to hear how much I'm making sense <laughs> Um, this lecture is one I definitely wish I could see all of your faces and pick up on all those subtle cues about whether things are going okay or not okay. Um, but let me know if you've if you've got things to ask or even just something like, uh, can you say more about just th this thing? And I might I might be able to help. Um, okay, but here's what does Rawls predict we actually are going to agree to under the original position? And let me pull up my lecture notes for this because I want to keep it organized here. So this is on page two, if you're following along on my lecture notes uh, in chat here, um, what I call the heading with the principles. The principles. Biscuit says Rawls is nice. Yes. He's nice. He's nice. But he's fair. That's the, that's, fairness is better than niceness. Um, he would say, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> Not very realistic. Oh, boy. Well, morality is not a matter of realism, um, but I don't, I actually, I, I mentioned that I wanted to start with Rawls because I think he's actually giving an abstract theory of justice that's a lot easier to place yourself personally in, to like get imaginatively a part of. And if you really think about it, like, why should people participate in society if it's not serving their interests at all, if they're basically being completely neglected by it, right? I mean, that's a practical matter. This whole thing that we have would fall down if people didn't keep participating in it. And in many ways, people participate it sometimes just out of fear. You, but there's people who are like, I'm fed up. I'm done with this. And then you get revolutions. So social stability is always on a little teetering edge here. And I think societies ignore social justice at their own peril as, as just a purely practical situation. Right? And in any event, um, justice doesn't have to be practical to be right. Rawls's theory is about inclusion and fairness. That's exactly right, Leticia. Yes. I mean, fairness is really in terms of inclusion, I would say. Like, given, you know, we have all these different ideas of what fairness could mean. For Rawls, it means uncoerced agreement. Um, a consensus that's arrived at between people that really respects them in the kind of autonomous way that Kant talks about, right? Kant's whole thing about treating people as ends in themselves instead of as means would put you directly in the position of finding Rawls a compelling way to approach social justice. That it's like, we're not looking for a situation where I'm just able to leverage my power over you and your agreement is just a mechanism I use to get what I want. But I want your real agreement. I want your real yes. A yes that you would give if you had all the power to do whatever you wanted, that you could be like, yeah, I would agree to that. That's what I, I think Rawls is shooting for here. And and in terms of practicality, just back, I'm sorry, I, I get I get triggered by the practical thing because I get that a lot in teaching ethics. And people are always like, oh, ethics is impractical kind of thing. When In the community work that I've done, the community leadership work, I've, I've had the, the honor and privilege to do in my life, to have that opportunity. I've seen this really happen that communities fall apart when they're not operating in this kind of way. When people are just like, yeah, we just, we just have this kind of quid pro quo thing going on, and as long as it's to my advantage and to your advantage to continue the association, then it'll happen. But what happens when things get rough? Well, if you've got a relationship that's built around win-win, then you can weather those storms then your, your community can be stronger, and it's capable of doing a lot more. It's way more empowered. Um, so in many ways, I would say this isn't just a matter of a nice, pretty picture that seems ideal, or wouldn't it be nice, but it actually is empowering. There's a lot of practical advantages to doing things this way. I mean, just imagine if people uh, participated in the government not out of necessity or compulsion, but from a free yes saying, and not a free yes saying that's the product of brainwashing or some kind of crap like that, not any coercive means. But people are like, yeah, I actually care about this. I'm invested in doing this. It'd be a totally different ball game, a very, very different ball game. The weird thing about 
Um, well, okay. Now I'm just I'm, I need to be careful about going off on a million tangents all the time here. There's a lot of cool stuff to talk about with this, but let's let's get the details here of Rawls's position. Okay. So the principles he thinks we're going to agree to. First, a negative answer. Will utility be a proposal? Well, if it gets proposed in the original position, Rawls doesn't think it's going to have a lot of legs. And the reason is that <clears throat> he hasn't eliminated the notion of self-interest, rational self-interest. People are still doing that. They just don't know what their contingent circumstances are, so there's no way for their consideration of argument to be able to be biased and slanted to their personal advantage. But the whole idea of subscribing to a system of cooperation that necessitates that some people basically take one for the team doesn't seem to be right, that it's not going to elicit that universal buy-in. This doesn't mean or preclude that people don't have the freedom to sacrifice what's going on with them for the greater good. It's just that that can't be considered mandatory. That can't be considered a principle of social justice, that it has to work this way. Imagine if people in the original position were like, the proposal was put, well, okay, let's um, let's have 5% of the population be slaves. And we'll maybe even determine that randomly. We'll just determine it randomly. And 5% will be the slaves, and then everyone will be able to maximize utility this way. And let's just say that would actually maximize utility. Like I've said before, utilitarians are usually staunchly opposed to slavery. Okay, but let's just say because of some circumstances, that would be the way. People in the original position, Rawls thinks, aren't going to buy into that. They're not going to agree to that. In the same way that they don't want to roll the dice and agree to a system of participation here, a cooperation, in which there's like 1% of people that have everything and everyone else is in abject poverty. They're not going to roll the dice for that. <clears throat> Everyone's always worried about worst case scenario. And if the proposal is 5% of the population is going to live in abject slavery with no freedoms, no rights, and no benefits, then people aren't going to agree to that. And utilitarianism as we talked about before, sometimes mandates things like that. Like the action that really does maximize utility might involve some pretty significant self-sacrifice. Okay, so Rawls doesn't think we're going we're gonna to agree to that um, out of the risk of being one of the people who has to bear that social burden. Uh, incidentally, I think it's somewhat ironic that he brings up utilitarianism here and why we wouldn't agree to it because it sort of condemns what we've got going on right now. Our system of society, our system of cooperation in our society basically operates this way. Um, I am not a, I do not have an advanced degree in economics, but as someone who's in ethics, it's impossible to avoid economics entirely. And I know some things about economics and I have some friends who work in economics. And one thing that has been reported to me is that some of the modern economic modeling of capitalism and understanding like how does the system actually work entails that Capitalism is only functional if there are a certain number of people who basically have to fail. In order for everyone else to kind of succeed, there have to be some losers, and they're basically screwed. They fall through the cracks. Um, so that's what we have right now is really a system that enables all these like good things to happen. Capitalism is has some pluses here in terms of like overall well-being for people. Um, but it happens at this kind of cost, and Rawls thinks we wouldn't agree to that kind of arrangement from the original position, which is a de facto condemnation of what we're doing right now, is not living in a just society. But here are the positive things that Rawls goes for. Two principles. First principle, each person is to have an equal right to the most extensive basic liberties compatible with similar liberties for others. We've talked about this before with the human rights theory, like every discussion of... Um, liberties and freedoms, um, what you have a right to, always has this little caveat of compatible with giving that equal privilege to everybody else. Okay, So you always have that going on. Rawls fills in some details here. Some people quibble about these details, about would people under the original position really agree to all these things. So you might disagree with some of this stuff on this list. Um, but, I mean, don't, don't take the whole proposal as dependent on whether you agree with the details here. It's whether the overall framework seems right. Like, we generally want freedom, but if we don't know who we are, then we're going to only agree to society setting up and protecting those freedoms that can be extended equally to everybody. So political liberty, right to vote, run for office, 
Rawls thinks democracy is going to be a, something we're going to have a preference for from the original position. Um, freedom of speech and assembly, liberty of conscience and freedom of thought, the right to hold per, uh, personal property, and freedom from arbitrary arrest and seizure. And here's actually where bringing in a little bit of Arnold is probably a good addition. Because remember, when Arnold is talking about these kinds of basic freedoms, he also says that they don't have unconditional uh, ex uh, scope, right? To say that people have a right to personal property, for instance, doesn't mean that people get to do whatever they want with their personal property. Like we think, um, just because the money I own is rightfully mine, doesn't mean I can use it to buy human beings as slaves. That's not, I, to say I have a right to private property is not uh, undermined by putting that kind of restriction on it. And that's going to go for all these things, that there's going to be cases under which there's certain conditions on it, right? So we're going to have to get a little bit more fine-grained in the scope of those rights. But Rawls thinks something in the territory of those things is, are the things that we will agree to. If someone supplied... Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that, Biscuit? Oh, yeah, you're not allowed to do that either. Like we say we have bodily autonomy. We have a right to our own control of our own bodies. Uh, I was talking about the bathroom example with Arnold, right? Um, we have proper dominion over ourselves, but also in our society, we don't allow people to disrespect themselves in this kind of way. Um, it's not allowable to buy and sell human beings on the market, no matter what the circumstances are. Even if I'm selling my, I can't sell myself on eBay as a slave. That's not allowed, right? The society puts a restriction on what I'm able to do with this thing that's mine. And there's a question, um, like remember uh, Duska talking about this. He says, "You sell your labor. You don't sell yourself to your employer. And if employers want to do that." then there'd be some there'd be a problem with that there'd be an issue of social justice there um, reminds me of the pawn policy can't pawn a living thing oh yeah 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 okay so that's the first principle and Rawls actually thinks this is the highest priority principle the the second principle is where a lot of the controversy usually comes from from Rawls this first one's pretty innocuous to most people um, there are some discussions about it like I said there's some debates about exactly what the scope of these rights ought to be there's some concerns about whether there's any bias going on here, kind of like Velasquez is worried about biases around what particular rights we think we have. Um, if I don't know, like, um, say what religious affiliation I am, like, I might be a re in a religion that, like, doesn't think that some of these rights are a good thing, that we shouldn't have them or something like that. Um, Rawls has some, there's, there are some other sticky things to get in here. But, but by far, it's the second principle that is the one that has sort of the most controversy around it or is sort of a bigger splash thing here. The first principle is pretty familiar to theories of social justice. But the second one is really interesting. So this is sometimes called the difference principle or the maxi-min principle. And the idea here is that social and economic inequalities can be just, but only under the conditions that they result in compensating benefits for everybody, and in particular, for the least advantaged members of society. And that's why this thing is called the maxi-min principle. So uh, Rawls says, social and economic inequalities are to be arranged so that they are both A, reasonably expected to be to everyone's advantage, and B, attached to positions and offices open to all. Okay, so um, I say here in my lecture notes, a method to imagine how to proceed. Imagine if all the social goods, everything that society has the power to affect based on how they set up the rules. Remember again, this is a conversation around social justice. This is a matter of how do we distribute the benefits and burdens of cooperation. That's what society has to control. That's what it has influence over. That's its sort of scope. That's its lane. Um, that's what we can design principles for. Like, like the government being like, how much are we going to tax and what are we going to do with the taxed money? right? Um, those, those are the choices here. And what Rawls is saying is, I, what I think is sort of the, the logic here, imagine we're in the original position under the veil of ignorance and we're starting the conversation. 
one of the first proposals that'll probably be put down is let's divide them all up equally. Let's distribute the benefits and burdens of social cooperation, split it down the middle, flat for everybody. I was uh, coming up with a, an example for my other class earlier today, and I used, um, the, again, this kind of example of a, a board game night that I set up here for my friends at my apartment. I invite everyone over, and we're going to get food, and we order a pizza or a couple pizzas. And how does that usually go? Everyone chips in equal amounts. You know, just split it. And there go actually with my friends group we don't usually do that. There's a lot of gifting that goes on with this. So someone's just like, yeah, I'll just buy the pizza. It's fine. You guys get me next time. That kind of stuff, which is a pretty cool arrangement on its own. Not very easy to have that kind of honor system if you're talking about an entire society or of a country or something like that. But the first thing that might be like, oh, you know what would be equitable would be, you know, just divide it all up. But imagine that scenario. There's going to be some basic inequalities that are part of people's individual circumstances, right? Some people might be hungrier than others, or they're going to eat more. Some people just eat more. Some, eat, some people eat less, less pizza. Some people might be under circumstances where they have greater food security or food insecurity. So what that pizza means to them is much more. People are also in different economic situations. Like 20 bucks to someone who's making six figures a year is very different from someone who's making under 30, right? 30,000 a year. Um, that 20 bucks has a lot of different meaning to them. And what Rawls is thinking about is taking into account those kinds of situations. Not in a sense of uh, utilitarianism. Um, Rawls doesn't think we're going to uh, opt for a complete welfare state or something like that. Um, but he does think that we're we're going to be have a natural inclination for equality here, but we're going to be willing to tweak it. We're going to be willing to uh, put different. Oh, are you okay, biscuit? I don't know what that emoji means. Whoa. I'll, I'll I'll keep talking. Feel I'd love an explanation of what you mean by that. Um, okay, so we're gonna we're we're kind of gonna tweak the baseline of complete equal distributions of benefits and burdens. We might tweak that because it can we stand to improve. Um, maybe centralizing some powers and responsibilities into certain positions or roles, like representative government. Like imagine if we had to vote on every single if every citizen had to vote on every single law the U.S. government was gonna pass. That wouldn't be a really great arrangement for anybody. I mean, the, to have everyone involved with the bureaucracy would just be practically terrible. Uh, that would make a lot more burden um, and not a lot of payoff, right? So we might be willing to have some unequal distributions here. Um, but what Rawls is saying with the Maxi Min principle is the only way those tweaks of inequality could be justified from the original position, people in the original position buying into that and saying, yeah, go for it, got my blessing, is if making those adjustments raises the opportunities and quality of life for the people who are on the bottom rungs of society. That's why it's called the Maxi Min Principle. The only way inequalities are justified is if that's happening. So if people on the bottom are benefiting from it, if it's, if it's raising the quality of life for them, then we're going to approve. Because like I said earlier, Rawls is concerned about, uh, he thinks in the original position, we're all going to be hedging our bets. We're still, we're still self-interested, right? We're worried about who we might end up being and what circumstances we'll be in back on Earth, right? We don't know who we are, but we're trying to hedge our bets as much as possible. We're going to buy into an agreement before we leave the veil of ignorance that worst case scenario, I'm still as good as I could possibly be. That's the Maxi Min principle. It's a really intriguing idea. Um, there's a, another little uh, quote here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Oh, I forgot. Dang it. Mm, oh, oh, I have an example, um, an illustration of this. Let's say that you and I are going into a startup uh, um, entrepreneurial endeavor together okay and originally you know we're like we're both putting in the same capital to invest in this whole thing and we uh, sort of promise we have an agreement we have a contract 
that the, the profits that we're going to receive from this effort, from this startup, are going to be divided equally between us, and we're going to kind of equally shoulder the burden of managing the whole endeavor, right? So it's not like one of us is going to be working 40 hours a week and the other person is going to be working 20. Um, we, we, do, we divide it all up equally, and we divide up equally the power of decision-making and things like that. But then as we get going in it and actually doing it, we realize, hey, you're better at some things than I am, and I'm better at some things than you are. Maybe we should redistribute these benefits and burdens appropriately, that it would be to our both, both of ours mutual advantage for me to give you some more power or and maybe even give you some more benefits, right? Or to take on some more of the burden, like I'll be able to do it better than you can, and you're going to benefit from the fact that it's been done better, this kind of thing. That's the kind of logic that Rawls is thinking about with the Maxi Min principle. We're not just going to be okay giving people certain advantages because of the way it works in the actual world where it's like, well, I get a personal something out of it, um, but really just because of my relative position of powerlessness with respect to you, right? I'll go along with not getting in the way of your power because it would be harder for me to do that. Like when thinking about the revolution sort of scenario, right? Like would we actually revolt against our, our social order to create a new one? Well, if we did that, there'd be a lot of costs. So maybe it just makes sense for me to just keep following the gravy train and keep my mouth shut and don't rock the boat, right? I've got more personal advantage of that. But from the original position, we're not talking about this, right? We're talking about not taking for granted the existing framework, but rethinking the fundamental rules of how society would be organized. And from that position, the maxi min principle is how Rawls thinks we're going to argue about it. So that's what we get. Um, okay, so some closing comments here. Um, I like this way that Rawls puts it. This is the quote I was trying to find earlier. Um, or this is really a note I came up with to summarize what he's saying, but this is what Rawls is saying. Um, if we're thinking about the maxi min principle, the difference principle, and the justice principle, uh, the freedom, I'm sorry, the, the uh, liberty principle, in combination as defining the rules for social justice. So that's, that's what Rawls thinks we're going to agree to as the vision of social justice. Those are the ground rules. If we agree to that, then basically we could describe injustice as inequalities that are not to the benefit of all and especially the people on the bottom okay um, oh this is another thought that I want to make sure I got in when you think about conversations about social justice today especially in politics there are some reflections and echoes of Rawls thinking here partially because of his great intellectual influence in the 20th century but also just because of I, I think he's like talking sense about how communities work Right? You don't have to be, you don't have to have read Rawls to pick up on some of these ideas, even implicitly. If you've done any kind of community work, um, I think you've learned some of these things implicitly. Um, that's definitely been true in my experience, at least. I, I don't know, I, I can't speak for yours, but you don't have to read Rawls to get these ideas. Um, but uh, the way a lot of things work in our political discussions today is thinking about like what sort of maximizes. Um, not just the people on the very, very top, right? They have to kind of be sneaky about that, right? When they want to lobby the government for things, they have to do it kind of on the, on the down low because, you know, they're not going to be able to get democratic support uh, for this stuff. They, so they have to couch it in other things, right? Secret little um, thing or like pork barreling stuff or secret deals with, with lawmakers, uh, or calling it something else or justifying it with some other principle that people who are not wealthy could be down with, like appealing to um, that rugged individualism as a virtue or something like this, right? So there's, there's other things that have to be sneaky about. But in the more public sphere of these discussions, you get what I might call the maxi-mid principle, um, that basically we, we talk about government policies as being appropriate if they are elevating or promoting or benefiting the middle class not poverty right not people in poverty below the poverty line um, but people in this middle class and to a certain extent like the middle class is kind of a myth there's a whole it presently it's a myth it doesn't really exist we, we can talk about that sometime but that's a that's a much longer conversation for me to say that but 
a lot of times it's looking at people that are in that kind of position rather than the people at the bottom. I don't know if any of you know about um, the uh, Poor People's Campaign, which is another kind of like um, political movement happening right now. It's actually derivative of something that um, MLK did um, back in the Civil Rights Movement that wasn't just about um, race, but it was also about class and poverty. Um, that people in poverty are like underrepresented in the government and the government's not working for them. And that's the kind of thing that Rawls thinks we will agree to under the original position. Okay. A um, couple other co uh, of these uh, final notes here. So I think it's important to note for Rawls, natural, di uh, natural distributions are neither just nor unjust. So this is something I said at the beginning, that how social institutions deal with those facts is where we get into justice issues. So very similar to that example I used with the Title IX office. The school isn't able to take on the responsibility of all potential individual wrongdoers who are going to do injustice. But what they do have responsibility for is how they set up the rules for how Bellevue operates as an institution in response to those kinds of possibilities or those things actually occurring. Um, same thing here with social justice on an economic scale. We recognize people are going to be in different positions, um, just even genetically. Um, there's a lot of ways in which we're the same, but there are some meaningful differences and different circumstances that we have to face, uh, things that we're working with here. Um, it's a big difference to be able to be in a stable home versus an unstable home, to be living in poverty versus affluence. That's, that's different stuff, and it sets up what kind of person you are for the rest of your life or what you're working with, right? Not doesn't maybe set your destiny, um, but it definitely affects what you're working with. And what is society's just response to those natural inequalities that you don't have control over individually? Um, that is what social justice is about. So uh, Rawls answers the question, do we deserve our fate or do we deserve our natural advantages or our genetics or something like that? And he says, no. Deserving something is not an intrinsic natural feature. What you deserve basically will emerge after we figure out what the principles of social justice are. They will define the extent of what you are entitled to in every way that goes beyond just the natural, or not, sorry, I can't say natural, but the, the intrinsic moral dignity that comes from the principles of justice themselves. Okay? Um, so I like this, this way uh, Rawls put, can put it. Here's a quote from him. This is what I'll leave you with. Um, the more advantaged person cannot say that they deserve and therefore have a right to a scheme of cooperation in which they are permitted to acquire benefits in ways that do not contribute to the welfare of others. That, you know, in a, in a sentence sort of captures the overall vision here of what Rawls is up to. Um, that some people might have some natural advantages over other people. That itself is not a social injustice. And, we, and Rawls says it's not really an issue of justice at all. Nature doesn't have any justice in it. But once you've got people, agents, who are making decisions about what to do with that, and they're organized in systems of cooperation that can do something about that, then what is the way that they ought to do that? That's the real question. And Rawls thinks just because someone has some natural advantages doesn't mean that they can, they have a right to say leveraging that power in order to create a system of cooperation where they're able to leverage their power even more to gain even more benefit through the coercive participation of other people in that system of cooperation. Rawls is like, that makes no sense. And to anybody else, I, I mean, I, if you have moral intuitions that uh, don't align with that kind of moral sentiment, then I'd start pointing you to the the logical arguments of this and maybe even to Kant himself. But my guess is that that sounds about right. That um, even if I have a right to what I do with my own body, with my own life, you know, the kind of bootstraps myth, myth or image or narrative or something, even if I only have a right to what I'm doing, I don't have a right to a system that allows me to leverage it against other people that they have to participate in for that to work. That's the big idea here. Okay, um, we're over two hours here. We should probably close up shop here. Uh, I know it's getting really late. 
but I want to see how everyone is doing here. No one has asked me any questions. I still have these mystery uh, emoticons from Biscuit um, that I'm not sure what you were trying to indicate, <laughs> and I'm curious. Um, but if anyone else has something they want to ask about this, I mean, my my afternoon class was just like nonstop conversation because I think there's a lot here to respond to and to have reactions to. Um, and I'm really curious what your experience has been of this lecture and what I might be able to speak to to help uh, with everyone who's watching this later, too. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yep. Not hearing from anybody. Oh, we need to do a code word. You know, uh, I talked a lot about board games tonight. Let's do a board game code word. Uh, and I'll um, build in, since we were talking about cooperation too. There's a lot of cooperative board games on the market these days. There is one, I don't usually like, give recommendations in a broad sort of way to all my students about board games, but there's one that I am like 99% positive any of you that end up playing it will really enjoy it. And it's super cheap too. And it's a card game called Hanabi, which is uh, Japanese for fireworks. So Hanabi will be the code word for tonight. H-A-N-A-B-I. Hanabi. You could also just put fireworks. I guess I'd take that too. Yep, that's right. Yep, that's our code word for tonight. Okay. Um, maybe while some people are typing anything in there too, I'll just say like, in many ways, Rawls's logic is at the foundations of what we currently have, the society that we currently have. And I think what it exposes are the kinds of hypocrisies about what's happening. That we tell a story about what we're doing in society as being just, but we're not taking it to the logical conclusion. That we tend to see the people, these like win-win situations between people who we acknowledge as our peers. And the people who are not in those categories we basically don't consider them or think that we have any obligations to them. But I, I find it, um, Americans are nice people. I mean, they're not just, uh, I don't think that we're a nation of purely narcissistic, self-aggrandizing pleasure seekers or something like that. People in America want to have positive relationships with other people. Um, there is selfishness, I agree with that, Biscuit, that definitely happens. But there's other parts to people here as well. And there's a lot of welcoming, there's a lot of inviting, there's a lot of like, I want to create a win-win situation, um, even in the business world. Yeah, you've got some people who are going for just the cutthroat, kind of like take them down type of thing, but there's a lot of people who are like, I'm going to get a lot more business if people want to do business with me. You know, I get a reputation for that, of like arranging situations that are of mutual benefit. Uh, I've got another board game here, it's science fiction about between different races. And it's competitive, but it's basically a game of who can out-cooperate everyone else. It's a pure negotiation bidding game. It's an economic engine game. It's beautiful. Um, but we, So I think we do this, and we do it selectively. And what Rawls is reminding us of that's very much in the Kantian spirit is that we cannot do it selectively if we're going to call it socially just. So we, I think we, uh, that Americans do have intuitions for a Rawlsian framework, and for anyone that they actually are in relationship with, it feels compelling that this is how we ought to respect each other. But then we have all these ways of basically ignoring others. And um, I think I've said before, I should be turning my hat for this, but um, I really do think that what money gives you in terms of power is the ability to not be in relationship with people. And what sort of, or maybe to pretend like I'm not in relationship with other people. But what Rawls is pointing out to us, and that's just a, kind of a part of social justice itself, is that we aren't alone. We're not an island. Um, everything that we do depends on everyone else. Uh, Leticia says, America is a great model of society compared to many others, but it's not perfect. But it is a model. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm going for here. That like, um, the idea of like burning down the whole thing in America. Personally, like my hat's turned, I'm like, I don't, I don't think that's the right way to go. There's too much good stuff to use as a foundation um, that to like start from scratch, I'd be not so confident about. But there are some real deep flaws that make that a hard, hard decision to make. Um, some very deep structural and systemic flaws um, that we 
got to take seriously. But if Rawls doesn't sound like that batshit crazy, like that far out in terms of values that we ordinarily use, then we just maybe need to be more consistent in applying them. Okay, um, it's a lot of time. Anyone else want to ask anything here before we shut it down? You're welcome. Hope I was able to make make this whole thing make more sense and be accessible and understandable. Some people type in here. Smiley face. <laughs> um. Oh, Walter. Oh, you put your video on. I I uh, lock the video here. I'll unlock the my video so people can see other people. There you are. Hey. I just do that for the recording, um, so that my I'm I just do a screen cap right of what's going on in the video chat. So, cool. All right. Well, I will shut down the video to everyone on YouTube. See you later. See you next week. Um, everyone, please stay in contact with me about your papers. We've got a week from tomorrow before they're due. So let me know how I can help you. I'm always willing to do this. I. Uh, even if it's last minute, but don't wait to the last minute because then I'll probably my phone will be blown up and I won't have a lot of time. So if you want to definitely get a hold of me, better do it sooner rather than later. Um, but uh, I'm happy to be a part of this process, like I've said before, as much as you'll let me at whatever stage in the journey that you you're at with it. So um, stay on the horn with me sooner rather than later is probably best bet. Okay, see you later. <laughs>